There's a boy, a little boy, shooting arrows in the blue, and he's aiming them at someone, but the question is at who? Is it me, or is it you? It's hard to tell until you're hit, but you'll know it when they hit you, cause they hurt a little bit. Here they come, pouring out of the blue, little arrows for me and for you. You're falling in love again, you're falling in love again. Little arrows in your clothing, little arrows in your hair. When you're in love, you'll find those little arrows everywhere. Little arrows that will hit you once and hit you once again. Little arrows that hit everybody every now and then. I remember we got in it to be maybe five shillings to go in. This is now in the 50s when it was 18, 19, 20 years of age. Be five bob, which was a fair bit of money, <laughs> may I add. And there'd be great crowds there on a Sunday night, but you could be assured that there was no... You'd never see a drunken girl. You'd never see a girl there with drink on her. Uh, if a girl came into a pub, well, that'd be, this would be the talk of the town for a fortnight. There was no alcohol. We hadn't any cars, so we had the bicycle. Look, many a time I brought a girl home on the bicycle. And, the, <laughs> and that was the normal thing. Then inside the door, if, if you say, ah, oh, yeah, I think I, I, might, I might get off with the Mary Kate tonight. If you were lucky enough to get a lady's choice from her late on in the night, you were sort of in business, you see. And then what you did then, before the dance started, before the last dance, you'd bring her out. There was a little room outside where you could buy her a, a club cola. Nothing stronger. And then you bring her in and give her the last dance and you were in business then. So you could either walk her home or cycle her home. And if you got one or two kisses or a squeeze off her, you were in, in, in heaven. And that's the way it was. When it came to social occasions, there was little to beat Ireland's booming dancing scene from the 50s onwards. In County Mayo, a plethora of dance halls and ballrooms spread right across the county ensured punters of memorable nights. From brill cream to bicycle clips and minerals to the music that rocked a generation, we now take you down memory lane to reminisce on those truly golden years of spellbinding show bands, the promoters and the punters who recall individual memories of times and places. People travelled in their thousands to places such as the Horseshoe Hall in French Hill, the Riverside in Clogher, the Gaiety in Island 80, Teddy Riley's in Glen Island, the Tennis Pavilion, the Plaza and the Town Hall in Castlebar, the Round Tower in Thurlock, Touring Ballroom and dozens more. The clientele travelled predominantly on bicycles and distance was no object. Show bands from all over Ireland mushroomed as the dance hall scene electrified and romance blossomed. It was a truly magical era, and few will have been part of the scene without having visited the biggest and brightest of them all, the Royal Ballroom in Castle Bar. Pat Jennings, the owner of the TF Royal Theatre, recalls the early days of the Royal and how his father, Paddy, set about building a ballroom that entertained a whole generation. My mum and dad met while in England, and they were both working in England during the war. And they came home in the late 40s, I think it was 47 or 48, and my father at that time was working in St. Mary's Hospital where he was a chef. And when he was working in England, he was working on the buildings over there as well as everything else. And he worked in a number of pubs, but he also drank in a number of pubs. And when he was on the buildings, uh, he was building Heathrow Airport or helping to build Heathrow Airport. I think it was a block there. And he used to drink in a pub called The Traveller's Friend. And it's still there today. I was actually over there about two years ago and I stood outside it. And uh, he said and then at the time that he wanted to go home and build his own place and he was going to call it the Traveller's Friend and that's where the name came from. And then in 1963, the Royal Ballroom was built. Now at that time, um, Paddy MacDonald was the builder and it was mostly local local workmen uh, from Island 80 and in around Castle Bar. And there was no like um, big diggers or, or, or uh, technological machinery like they'd have today. And uh, that opened in December uh, 63 with the Capital Show Band, Bushmore in the Capital, and proved to be one of the single biggest uh, auditoriums in the West of Ireland for a long number of years. Born to be with you. Cause I 
Well, the Royal Bottom uh, in '63 was very basic, you know, compared to what we have today. Um, when I was young, um, my job was to sweep the Royal Bottom before I went to school on a Monday morning. And my father would have a little red notebook and he'd write the jobs down and I'd have to take them off and I got paid my pocket money on a Friday evening like everybody else. So at that time, you know, we had just basically brushes and you just sweep it down. And after school, we'd come home, we'd have to wash the floor. And then we'd do our lessons and our sums and all the rest. Um, and of course, you know, there, there are favourite stories about that time because hard and all as it was, we were as a family unit and, you know, we enjoyed it and we did what we had to do and that was it. But um, the only place in the hall that was carpeted was the band dressing room because the band were the stars of the show at that time. And it was an interesting place because when the bands used to come in with their, with their um, suits and suit bags, that, um, like say Eileen Reed and the cadets would come in, They'd come in and they'd, they'd hang up their suit bag and they'd take off their clothes and take out the suit, that they're, their, their stage gear, and the coins that were in their pockets would fall on the carpet, but nobody would hear the coins falling. So being the industrial young fella I was at the time, the first place we'd hit for was the band dressing room because we'd get maybe half a crown on the floor, and that was like bonanza. The next best place was outside the snack bar. And the snack bar was a mineral bar because you, there was no drink license at the time and you, were, you weren't allowed to sell any alcoholic drink. So there was only minerals. And there was barely even Coke available at that time. So there was a saying goes, and, and uh, Frank Nolan, who used to do the till that time, would always say it was club orange, club milks and matches. We didn't sell cigarettes, but we sold matches, strange enough. And then outside the bar counter, the snack bar counter, you know, there was always a place as well where you'd search straight away because everybody would lose some bit of coin and, you know, as it happens to people at the bar counter, they drop something and <clears throat> they may be talking to the bird or something and they say, well, look, you know, forget about it. I keep talking. I'm doing well here. So as a young fella, that's what we used to do. And our mates from up the avenue who, you know, Ivan Mohan, Ray Quinn, Eamon Callan, Parry Garrity, all those guys, that's what we used to do and that was our pocket money. Um, after dances was another favourite time whereby the security or the bouncers, as they're more locally known, would have a game of football with the band. And we would uh, put down four coats, two, two at each end, and we'd have a game of football in the hall at four o'clock in the morning for half an hour. Strange as though it may seem. And, uh, you know, I played football indoor with, you know, Big Tom or Larry Cunningham or these guys. They were, they were huge. You know, there was a great sense of camaraderie with the bands. And, you know, I, 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 I've I been booking bands since I was 14 or 15. And, you know, I'd know all those guys now and I'd treat them as sort of friends of the house rather than, you know, employees are coming. And gradually, you know, when, when if you take it, like, you know, some of those bands will pay six or eight times a year and they'll be playing with you for 20 or 30 years. You get to know them very well and you get to know their families as well. So there's a whole community out there of bands in Ireland that... You know, like everybody knows one another. It's one big happy family, and uh, it works well. It works well. Sunday morning, up with the lark. Think I'll take a walk in the park. Hey, 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 it's a beautiful day. I got someone waiting for me. When I see her, I know that she's safe. remember one thing about them but you'd have a barrier over there where the women would stand behind so that when the lads would come rushing over the women wouldn't get pushed so if you wanted to dance with someone you had to go in wherever the gap was and uh, but it was great experience and it was great credit to Paddy Jennings at the time to build the ballroom and uh, to give scope and entertainment but my whole experience would be the Royal Ballroom in Casa Bar which was the thing at the time. Hi, 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 
the admission charges would have been two and six, five shillings, uh, something like that. Uh, I remember when I went up to seven and six, there was a Ferrari, and I remember we had uh, the Clancy brothers and Tommy Maycomb, I went up to seven, six, and, and they thought it was a you know ridiculous price at the time, but they came, place filled, and uh, then it went to 10 bob, 10 bob note, and uh, stayed at that for a good while. It was very hard to break that sort of a barrier, but uh, then the old pound came in, and you know, gradually it's moved from then. Uh, and then with the change of currency, obviously it moves again. But um, you know, I used to do the box office when I was very young, and um, it was a tiny box office in the Royal Ballroom. And uh, I was in sort of short trousers, and I wasn't allowed count the money, count the notes as they came in, but I was allowed flatten them. So I used to have you know short trousers on me and. You know, being the industrious man that I was at the time, there was a stray tin bob note went astray and nobody knew the difference. So that kept me happy at the time without saying anything to me, mum or dad. But uh, these are the, the, the tales of, 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 of a young fellow who was like trying to better himself all the time, I suppose, as best they could say it. They, they, there were so many people that you would recognise from coming dancing and there were such loyal fans to each of the respective acts my dad died when I was 11 and he died in 67 and a chap called Jerry MacDonald uh, took over who was a friend of the family and he used to work at the clinic across the road. He booked, you know, most of the bands when, when I was sort of young until I sort of took over from him. And he had a full circuit of, of, of bands and dance halls that they used to play in around and he booked, you know, the Starlight in Westport or the Pontoon Ballroom. Um, also, uh, Ballyhonnis and it was known as the Eclipse Ballroom in Ballyhonnis and, and then there was chains of ballrooms across the country you know the Con Hines organisation or Albert Reynolds Albert Reynolds had all the, uh, the like it was called the Fairyland or the Starland or the Cloudland and you know the famous story of Albert walking into the big dance hall and you know he would quip in and being the usual the bullions himself that Albert is he walk in and say big hall hard to fill and uh, all these stories, but like Albert was a very good uh, supporter of the dance halls as they were, the dance halls were a supporter of Albert. And again, he built up a lot of his loyal base of supporters from the dance hall community and still is today. And uh, he's been a great benefactor to the live music down through the years. The Brass Watch Band holds a special place in Irish showbiz history as it survived an unprecedented six decades of continuous success. Based in Bel Cara, the band and its leader proved legendary, not only here in Ireland, but also in Britain and America. He was Mayo's musical ambassador, and his death in 1995 at the age of 75 left a huge void in the music industry. His memory lives on, and so too does the Brass Watch Band, where his sons James and Tomás know only too well the impact their dad had on the music scene. My father was born in Belcara and he was of a family of 11. Most of his brothers and sisters went to America and they went at the time of the Depression. He stayed at home. His uh, sister sent him home the money for an accordion and he bought an accordion and started playing. And that's where he... Uh, started first. Then he started his first night in uh, French Hill, St. Stephen's night, 1937. And he got uh, a lot of dances after that. That time dances were held in the houses. And then it uh, upped a bit, you got the local village dance hall, and he started moving along then. And then the war came. And he had a problem, he was after buying a van, he had a problem with the war, he couldn't get petrol to travel. But he had a, a way of doing that. He worked on the lorries that time, drawing the turf on the bogs. And you could hire out the lorry for the day and draw turf. And you'd be supplied with petrol. So whatever petrol was left, he had it for himself to bring him round the country. And he'd always, that's how he got out of Castle Bear and, uh, and he got down, we'll say, the south. And he was very, very popular down the south. And that would be in the 40s and 50s. At one stage, I think he had 14 men in the band. At another stage during the war, he had three Germans that left Germany and came to Ireland to avoid the war, and they were playing with them. 
Then in the early 60s, he did a tour of America. He wasn't the first Irish band to go to America, but I think he was the second. And uh, that was a very successful tour. He did England a lot. That time you had Lent. There was no dancing in Ireland during Lent. And uh, he had to go to England for, we'd say, four or five weeks to uh, keep the band together and the boys working. My father was a good boss. His philosophy was, whatever you seen out in the ballroom, out in Ireland or whatever, you didn't bring it home or you didn't tell stories. But you had great fun, you met people, you built up a great relationship with different people all around the country. Maybe £25 was a fee that time. It was great money. You had cash. And as they say now, cash is king. So uh, when you paid your tax, you had a little bit left over. Red sails in the sunset We are on the sea Oh, carry my loved one Home safely to me Oh, she sailed at the dawning All day I've been blue Red sails in the sunset I'm trusting in you. But to tell you the truth, I was the first into the band of the three of us, uh, we'll say, when I got out of my father's band. But as my brother was saying there, we had a little band at the age of 12. And we, if the lads were off the band, uh, some of the band members, uh, Ledger King and God rest him and Tommy Devaney, uh, would be teaching us guitars and pianos and all this thing and saxophones and clarinets and that's how we start. We formed a little band and he's the big four, Pat Bogig and them times he'd be coming to the festival in Bell and they'd always, he'd always insist on somebody playing for two hours beforehand. So we used to go in, we were, we called ourselves the casino at the time and there was James and Jimmy DC was on the drums and John Noel and myself and uh, Tommy Devaney, he told my father to give Tommy Devaney off the band to keep us together for the... And every time the big four came to the festivals around the place, they get them young lads there for us. And we always went in, you get £12 at the time. And of course, at the age of 12, that was a lot of money for us guys uh, to be getting that type of thing. But then at, we all went to Jarrett's and I remember when i come home, uh, I used to be doing the guitar with Ledger King and teach him with the chords and all that to change. And, my father would say, come holiday time, do you want to play? I would, and he used to give me eight pound a week. And I remember at summertime when I go back after the three months off, I'd be the richest man in jail. It's my father, but being a passing once a week at the band at the time, then he'd call in and I'd say, bring us a fiver. Which sure, my other two brothers were, give us a loan of a pound and all that. Sure, I was the richest man in jail, so no one knew it. But that's a we and yeah. um, you know you could send out at the day pupils for, for food, extra food and sweets and all that so we had great times and every time I came home from school straight out with my father now I will admit now the three was all well got with my father as regards we could speak anything but, but I suppose myself and himself were more like thick as thieves like what will I do with the van and all this he'd always come to me about that type of thing and then eventually he said you take the diary I thought it was funny one night we were playing and he got sick and uh, we were playing for a priest and the priest says Oh God, he says, I always dealt with your father. I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't pay you a story. He said, I'll pay your father, he says, the next time we're here. He was looking for a, I'd say a few bob off. So the next night we came, and I was doing the dates at that stage, and we played for the same priest again, God rest him, he said, since of, and he says, um, Bros, come out here till I pay you now. And my father didn't move at all. He says, Tomas, go out there and, so I went out and uh, oh, I said, I don't want to see you. He said, I want to pay your father. Oh, he says, I said to him, my father's not, my father's nothing got to do with this at all. He says, I, I'm paying him. What? He said, oh no, he said, I couldn't deal with you. And so I said, oh, well, I don't know. So he calls out my father and my father comes out and he says, oh, father, I've nothing got to do with it. This guy's paying me a week's wages. He says, deal with him. Oh, Tomas, do your best with him. And we were on, we were on a uh, 50 pound 25 at night at the time, that was £50. So he said, how much do we owe you, young fella? I said, 60 is grand. What, he said, 60? I, I didn't, we didn't agree on 60. Jesus, oh, I said, it's, that's, what about the last gig? I said, this one, 30 and 30 makes 60. 
No, he said, it does not. He says, 25 and 25 makes 50. I said, you're an awful man, Father. I said, if you insist, give me the 50 so I'm happy. Sure, I knew if I said the 50, he wouldn't, give me, he wouldn't pay me 40. Although the music scene in Mayo was dominated by practically all male bands, there was a few exceptions, and one notable one. Nan Monaghan was born in McHale Road, Castle Bar, and she became a household name from a young age around County Mayo and further afield. A natural talent with a distinctive voice, Nan had an immediate attraction to music, and she quickly fulfilled that dream. When I was a child, that time there was a man called Kevin Collins here and you'd get music sheets, it was a penny for a music sheet. And the music was on it and the words were on it. And my grandfather used to give me four pence a week. That's for cleaning up the house and doing, looking after the rest of them. And I'd get four pence and the first two pennies I'd spend, we'd be down to Kevin Collins to get this sheet music. And that was music at that time about Doris Day and all ones like that. And. Uh, You'd learn how to sing these, and I would, I'd, be si- I'd be sitting outside the bacon factory shop, singing away to my heart's content. And one day a man came up, I was 14, and a man came up to me, Tony O'Grady. He was originally from Manola. And he came up and he said to me, would you like to sing with a band? I, I said, I, Jesus, I said, oh, I said, I, I, you better talk to me, mommy, you know, me mum and dad. So he did. And there was murder in the house. There was open murder because, believe me, at that time, I'm going back to the 40s, it's not the glamorous occupation it was. It was, quite truthfully, if it was a very, very low occupation you could be in. And my father hit the roof. But this man said, this Tony O'Grady said, that he would mind me and take care of me. And he did. And the first place I ever sung in was the Eclipse Ballroom in Ballyhonis. And the first song I ever sung was Buttons and Bows. <laughs> and there was a great friend of ours, he was the Archdeacon, Archdeacon Prendergast, that lived in the big house. And he came over that night to hear me sing because my aunt, Aunt Kit Malahi, she told him that I was singing and he came over. I, I loved it. I don't know, I just loved it and that was it. That was, that was my lifetime job. The Lord to mercy on PJ. PJ came to me one day and he said, we should have to group. And I said, right. Will I manage it? Well, I said, I'm not going to manage it. If you want to manage it, fair enough. So we managed it, and he did. A fabulous man, God rest him, a fantastic man. He started to cut out all the small lounges in the, the, the pubs, and he decided we'd go into the bigger lounges. So we used to go into the bigger lounges. So then one night we were in the rafter rooms in Kilchama, and he said to me, Jess, I have an idea. And I said, what the idea was? Jess, he said... The, the Times is out there, he said, and killed them all. I'm going to bring the two of them in here, he said. We. So he brought in Tommy and Jimmy Swarbrick, and they heard us, and they decided that they'd give us the relief work. So it went from there. We'd done relief work for every top show band in Ireland for five years, north, south, east and west, for a 50 miles radius. That's the truth. I mean, what he'd done was unbelievable. It was absolutely unbelievable. We got on very well, and we done very well. And of course, as I, we done relief down here as well in the Royal Ballroom. And when I'd be finished with the relief then, I had to come back up and sing with the Maryland Swing Tet for the rest of the night. <laughs> I am thinking tonight of the days long ago And my mind wanders back to a town The gay times I spent there, my heart feels so low. When I think of my hometown, Castle Bar in Mayo. I think I have the distinction of being the only woman that sang with the great Mick Delahunty's band. When he used to come, I used to always go with him as a guest artist. He heard me here first in. I was singing on the stage here. I was five years resident here in the TF. And for that five years, you'd have Monday night off, and I never walked the streets of Castle Bar for 10 years, at three and six a night. But it was good money. It was very, very good money, and I was at home. When you mentioned ballrooms, there was a ballroom, and that was the Royal Ballroom. Then you had the Town Hall, 
And then when the county cinema burned down, there was another place where they used to show the films. It was known as, called the Plaza. So the Plaza was up in Spencer Street, now where Tommy Robertson's garage is. So there used to be dances held there. But the majority of the halls, we say, north, south, east and west, they were all uh, rural halls, particularly down Ackle. They were all galvanised. They were abs- it was unbelievable. They were the all galvanised halls. There was all galvanised roofs on them. The floor, do you know the, how you throw crystals on a floor? Well, I've told this on many times, and it is the absolute truth. They used to put paraffin oil on them to make them slippy. And when you go in there, I often swore if you dropped a match, you were dead. That's a fact. That is the truth. There was no electricity. There were all gas lights and paraffin oil lamps. And there was no... Uh, the, the toilets. The toilets were all dry toilets. And the men had all come on the bicycles, and you'd see them getting off on the bikes and taking the bicycle clips off when they came in and sticking the pump at the bike inside. So, I mean, th- these were the ballrooms that I knew. But then when you started, when I, particularly when I started with Rose Walsh, he started to go into the bigger, bigger halls. As, uh, you know, a hall where you get, uh, you get your supper in it and you get, well, you get ham, tomatoes and what have you. But I remember on one occasion being in a particular hall down there in Ackle. And it was a gentleman that owned it, a grand man. And he said to me, now lads, come on over now, he said, and you can have a feed. The dance at that time used to go from nine to three in the morning. And he said to me, come on over now, lads, and you can have a grand feed. And on the table, when we, I was sitting with Tony Chambers, Monty, God rest his soul. When we went over to the table, there was, there was six cups, there was a loaf of bread, there was a pound of butter and a pot of jam and a knife, a jug of milk, and that was the big feed that we had. That was the majority that you get. In the bigger halls then, you'd always get ham and tomato. It was ham and tomato, ham and tomato, ham and tomato. But I remember one occasion we went to a place called Skibbereen. Now, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awful journey. We left, I think, at around half two in the day. And we got back, I think, around ten the next morning. Now, you go to bed, you'd have a couple hours sleep. And I was singing that time from we say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not Saturday, Sunday. And you'd have four weddings of brothers on top of that, or five. It was a job of work. And you never thought anything about it. It was, you know, it was just your work. Entertainment is my soul. Music is my soul. It's as simple as that. Castle Bar in Old Mayo. Castle Bar was a Sunday night dance. Claire Morris was a Sunday night dance. Westport was a Saturday night dance. Pontoon was a Saturday night dance. And Belly Hornus was a Saturday night dance. Or you could have, say, a Swinford, which would be a Friday night dance. So a band could be playing in Swinford on a Friday night and Westport on a Saturday night. And it wouldn't matter to the crowd, right? Because you could do a crowd in Swinford on a Friday night and you wouldn't do a crowd in Westport on a Friday night, or vice versa. So certain nights had a special affiliation with certain towns. So obviously Castlebar was a, was, was a Sunday night and a very big Sunday night. And, you know, Big Tom held the record at that time for, you know, Stephen's night. And there was a reputed to be somewhat like 5,000 people in the venue at the time. Uh, which was phenomenal crowds at the time, but obviously, you know, the health and safety regulations wouldn't put up with it today, but like that's what was done at the time. And people used to love it, and you know, you had the uh, the fashion of, of inviting girls to dance and the pushing and shoving and the, uh, you know, did you bring your knitting needles and all that, you know, the, all, all that was part of the camaraderie again at the time. There were dry halls, there was no drinking in them, but everybody you usually would, would, would get a bit of false courage from the local pub. And, and there was, you know, fighting and scrapping, but nothing like it is today. And, you know, everybody got home safe. And uh, generally, it was a happy time for everybody.
There could be a hop below in the town hall in Castle Bear because I knew everyone in the town for the simple reason that half the town, with the van we had at the time, if there was a dance on going on in Castle Bear, any place around the place, the young lads would say from McHale Road, would say, Bros, we're going to pant onto the carnival on Tuesday night, they'd hop into the van and there was lads and girls getting lit. So they all knew me. So when I went into the town hall, we'd say for a social, there was a, uh, used to be an on Tuesday night dance that would come in. Um, there was a dance in the Traveller Friend as well in Odd Nice. You could go back to Le Canvey to a dance. You could go to the Gacy and Island AD. You could go down to uh, Beaufin on. There was a lot of places going on. And if you were off, you could go to some of those. There was local bands and there was some of them from Dublin, but there was a lot of the bands now from Mayo. You had Jack Ruan's band, um, you had the Dominoes, you had uh, from Ballina, you had Kevin Burke here on the Royal Cards, Evelyn is right, you had uh, Pat Freeland, Westport, and the Basil Morhan, Dan the Street Singer, had a good band as well in Lewisburg. And then in the Jets here with Dick Gillespie and all that type of stuff. There was an awful lot of local bands. And if you were stuck, we'll say someone got sick, you could ring uh, another band and say, would you have a guitar player for the night or a trumpet player? And that's the way it was. And of course, you had Tony Chambers down in Newport. You had Jeannie Mac, every town in Ireland had a band. Matty McDonough and Clem Morris, and you had Johnny Brady, Pete Brown and Kilchema. Remember, there was an awful lot of employment in the music scene, when you look back over in years gone by, there was reckoned there was over 5,000 musicians employed full time. But I really had a ball last night. Yesterday I faced the big fight. But I really had a ball last night. Whoa! Everybody! to play a game that is so much fun and it's not so very hard to do the name of the game is simple simon says and i would like you all to play it too well i danced in the town hall in castle bar and the best of shore bands came into that town hall i heard mick Dillahunty, johnny quigley when i say top shore bands they were there and there were tops uh, Hugh Torres and the Clipper Carlton. Now, I was only a, a, a nipper, but by God, I remember it. Then, and enjoyed it. If you could square, you could square. A woman, if you got a woman. But you'd be shy. And if a lady's choice came, well, they might jump to you. And if they didn't, they didn't. And then the priest would be going around watching you to see whether you're holding her too close or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh, the yeah. priest would be there. Oh, oh yeah. Priest ran the dance in the town hall and close dancing was out. You were checked on the floor. The local bands at the time were Brotherwell, still going strong. Um, PJ Durkin, PJ Gill. The, a visit of Mick Delahunty from Clonmel was a huge attraction. He made an orchestra. It, that was terrific music at the time. And the Clipper Carton, of course, the band that started it all. Uh, they, they were a huge attraction. Always, since I was a baby upon your knee, you sacrificed everything for me. I stole the gold from your hair. In summertime, you'd have a marquee. Maybe you'd have it in a football pitch or somewhere like that. And the dances went on there for a week. And it was always, see, they never seemed to rain. And of course, it was dancing every single night for the week. And you had to save up a few bob if you wanted to go to two or three of them. And again, there was great crowds there uh, and a great atmosphere in the, in the, in the marquees. And it was generally, we say, golf clubs that held them or football clubs, Gaelic clubs, soccer clubs, and things like that. And they made a lot of money. But I, I enjoy going to the old uh, marquees. They were, they were an innovation at the time. But they, sadly, they have all gone away by now. Time marches on, and although the music scene and standards of dance halls has evolved dramatically, we still hold on to the desire to see live bands in action to this very day. The industry has seen more than its fair share of ups and downs. But the thrills and spills of dance halls from the 50s onwards in County Mayo is a unique facet of Irish life here and will never go away. 
Many of the stars of those glitzy days of the Irish showband era may be dead and gone, but their memories remain. Together again My tears have stopped falling The change in the country, the, the extension of the extension hours, the bar extensions, discos, it changed the whole way of life. And you had television then, coming in the 60s, in the late 60s, everyone got a television. That changed a lot, changed people's ways of entertaining themselves and having entertainment, and they got these shows on television, and they didn't go out as much. That was the big change. Dancing started going later, and the bands wouldn't go on until 12 o'clock. The real big guys didn't start, and now wouldn't go on until 12 o'clock till the crowd yeah. was in. And they were educating the people to go to the pubs and drink until 12 and then come in. And now the thing is reverting back again. I spotted the scene about 10 years ago that was starting to come back. That there, instead of these 2 o'clock dancing and 1, with the dancing like it was, we'll say it was 10 until 2, and the big band wouldn't come on until 12, so they had a warm-up band first, and a lot of people wouldn't bother, say we go to the pub for the first two hours and then they come in. There was a certain amount we had to, there was a certain amount that the bands had to, uh, had to, they have to take a bit of responsibility for the downfall too, that scene, that uh, they did. But then life changes and the circle changes. But you know, life changes. Life change, but doesn't the circle always seem to go round full circle again? You don't know what'll come on again. Times change and people change, so it, you don't know. Oh, it, 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 People are used to going out early now and they'll go home early and we are in the middle of a huge social change, you know, our, our, all our lives are being affected by exterior forces like, you know, drink driving, drugs, new legislation, the interpretation of the laws by the different relevant authorities and, you know, we, we're living in a different world and, you know, it takes the youth time to understand that and they will evolve the same as we evolved in our time. Um, we had a good time for youth in our days, and so the young people today are. But like one day they'll grow old too, and uh, another situation will develop. But it, it is beginning to change full circle. Uh, live music is still very strong, and there's a great tradition of it. But at the same time, you know, there's now a credible alternative to TV. Uh, at the time, time TV, when it came in way back in the 60s, it was a phenomenon altogether. Like if, an, if a house in the locality had a TV, they were a big attraction. Um, but now, of course, there's not one TV in a house, there's a TV in every room. So people are, 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 are uh, used to it and, you know, they're, they're going out now and find out that there's a credible alternative to TV. And, of course, people had to get involved in, in amateur drama society, which is always very popular in Mayo and across the west of Ireland, because you made a go of it and as, as referred to earlier during Lent you know the dances weren't allowed so they had to go for um, the, theatrical shows and all sorts of uh, you know travelling shows so uh, that's it we're, we're living in changing times and we're beginning to get back to where it all started They envy me my hills of clay The white gulls calling in the soft sea air So much to lose and yet I'd leave the hills of Clare And live in a desert if I had you there What would I lose If I could choose This program was produced by Ronan Carell and Tommy Maram. The program makers wish to thank the following contributors. Pat Flanagan, Jackie Loftus, Pat Jennings, James Walsh, Tomás Walsh, Nan Monaghan, Mickey Guthrie, Ger Dunn, Pat Nocton, and all the other contributors. This programme was funded under the Broadcasting Commission of Ireland's Sound and Vision Fund. If I could choose a time to talk with you, i choose the longest day. And over all the hills of Clare, I'd shout. last forever and I'd never leave your side if I could choose